Some women are bad, but a rare few are horrid. A dedicated wife turns cowgirl just for kicks. Evil can come in the most charming packages. A nurse who isn't a healer. She was no Florence Nightingale. You have no idea what I'm capable of. And an American pioneer who leaves a grisly trail. Terrible, terrible, terrible. These deadly women prey on the most vulnerable when they take a walk on the dark side. Forty-year-old Patricia Wells has dedicated her life to caring for the sick and frail. Good morning, Richard. Howdy, Patricia. She was a nurse, so she cared about people. She worked at a facility for the elderly, and, you know, she's doing a great job. In 1983, in Wilson, North Carolina, she finds a kindred spirit. I know how hard it can be. 73-year-old William Jennings. It really helps to talk to someone who's walked in my shoes. A recovered alcoholic. Sorry to interrupt. William is devoted to helping others. He's a good listener, isn't he? Sure is. William spent a great deal of his own time helping other people recover from alcoholism. See you next time. He's doing well, he's helping people, he's helping himself, and he's loving life. He meets this younger woman. I could use a good listener. Yeah. Even from an old goat like me. You're not so old. <laughs> How about dinner? I'm buying. <laughs> Despite their age difference, the pair feel an immediate spark. It made him feel good. It made him feel young. It made him feel alive again. By 1987, this unlikely couple get hitched. Patricia is 44. William is 77. Are you ready? Born ready. <laughs> it's not unusual for older men to marry a younger woman. One reason is, they want somebody to be there to take care of them as they get older. Hot damn. He was still very active. He wasn't frail. Oh, those boots starting. He may have been in his late 70s, but he was still, still a man. Get away. <laughs> it's the perfect partnership. Patricia looks after William. Mr. Jannins, is that a gun in your pocket? <laughs> he looks after everything else. Oh, no. It's a big, fat wallet. Oh. <laughs> Thanks to his hefty assets. He had invested in the stock market. He had a broker. And he had done very well in the stock market. You don't mind, do you, sugar? How can I say no to you? <laughs> To allow Patricia financial independence, the couple consult William's friend and financial advisor. So, how are the newlyweds? Blissfully happy. Once they got married now, it seems as though her interest turned more to what his financial situation was. Well, Pat's a bit worried that I can't handle my affairs. Well, he can barely cross the street on his own. Alrighty, um, what changes are we talking about? Transferring some of William's money to my account. How much? Half. Half of everything. William split the assets equally between them. That's your half, this is my half. Uh, don't worry. I'm in good hands. <laughs> Before long, Patricia is making the most of her financial freedom. 
and she begins to spend his money. Oh, Pat, it's you. Well, of course it's me. Who were you expecting? She's buying cars, going out to big expensive dinners, spending the money on jewelry on herself. Well, whose blue car is that in the driveway? What do you mean? It's my car. William is having trouble keeping track of their spending. I got a blue car. I know you got a red car. Bill, it's happening again. Go back to bed and I'll bring you your pills. Patricia blames his failing memory. And he's beginning to worry she's right. Patricia likes traveling, and William becomes even more disoriented when they hit the road. They basically traveled around to different locales, mainly staying at motels. Oh, George, <laughs> thanks so much for coming. One night, he finds himself alone in an unfamiliar room. I got here as soon as I could. He panics and calls his friend, George. Go, go on in. So, uh, what's going on, Bill? She took my wallet, my clothes, the room key. Well, I, I didn't know else to call. This frightened, confused old man is not the William Jennings that George knows. But Patricia takes control and explains away his behavior. Oh, for goodness sake, cover yourself up, you silly old goat. She blames it on dementia. He'll settle down once the pills kick in. <laughs> but William doesn't have dementia. It wasn't dementia, it was Patricia. It's been a gradual thing, dementia's like that. One day they're fine, the next. Yeah, well, shouldn't we? Good night, George. Patricia was a nurse. She knew exactly what drugs to give William to make him confused and disoriented, and then she would tell people that it was dementia. Patricia starts locking her elderly husband in hotel rooms for days at a time. She is living on his money, but he's there and he has no access to the money, and he's stuck in, in a room somewhere. She keeps him drugged. You know, over the course of their marriage, she begins to realize that <laughs> this guy's a pushover. I can do whatever I want to him. And it finally dawns on William. He's married a monster. Time for your medication. There was something in Patricia that eventually reared its very ugly head. Go back to bed and I'll bring you your pills. William Jennings is living in fear of a wife nearly half his age. In less than a year, Patricia drains his bank account of $130,000. The fact that Patricia went through William's money so quickly tells me that's what she was after all along. She drugs him to create symptoms of dementia. But there's far worse to come. Have you medication? I might not take the pills tonight, Pat. They're in my head all cloudy. Oh, you poor old thing. Oh! This is such a violent episode in William's life. He sees the true anger in her eyes. Who told you to think? Patricia actually begins to stomp on him 
with her cowboy boots. Patricia's monstrosity would make Godzilla run and hide. William is too proud or too afraid to leave. Men rarely leave an abusive wife. Oftentimes, it's because they're embarrassed or, in William's case, he was probably afraid to. Where would he go? Where's he going to get away from this wild woman? As usual, Patricia makes the decision for him. On September 19th, 1989, William is held captive in yet another hotel. By the end, he's got, what, 20 grand left? So you could say that she didn't need him anymore. Would you like me to adjust the air conditioning? No, uh -oh. it's fine. You don't understand what you're saying to me and Chip. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, does he have any special needs that we can assist with? I'm fine, thank you. William's final couple of hours were not only horrific, they were humiliating. Over the years of abuse, Patricia learns something about herself. She loves it. This ain't about the money anymore, Bill. No. It's about pleasure. She gets him on the ground, and she starts stomping on him. Patricia was a nurse. She knew how to end someone's life quickly and painlessly, but that's not what happened in that hotel room. It wasn't enough that she stomp him with her cowgirl boots on. Then she takes it to a new level, a new level of depravity. She sodomized him with some foreign object. Sexual assault of a dying old man. She took hours to kill this poor, frail man. That's sadism. A sadist enjoys the suffering of his victim. And so did Patricia. How you can be married to somebody, stay with somebody, and do that to somebody. Patricia is in no rush to leave the crime scene. She has a plan. After waiting several hours, she calls for help. My name's Patricia Wells Jennings. I, I'm a registered nurse, and I have a, a cold blue. He's my husband. We'll take it from here, ma'am. Patricia said she had awakened and found him there. How long has he been down? Oh, uh, I'm not sure about five, 10 minutes. Sir? Just five to 10 minutes before the paramedics arrived. He's ice cold. Nurse Patricia hasn't been very oh, smart. Oh, no. oh, no, no. If he's only been dead for a short period of time, why is rigor mortis starting to appear? <laughs> Rigor mortis doesn't even begin to set in until hours after death. He has a dementia. He, he hurts himself all the time. He, you know, he's... And she claims his multiple injuries are caused from falling out of bed. Bed would have had to be about two or three stories high because there was no way you're going to fall off a bed and have that kind of an injury. Detectives are shocked by some of William's wounds. There were a bunch of marks on the man's genitals, which nobody seems to be able to understand. Patricia wasn't fooling anyone. 
She didn't help herself when she asked the paramedics if they could recommend a good funeral home where he could be cremated. Funeral homes. Mm, yeah, uh, I want to get him cremated as soon as possible. Why? Because of an autopsy. So they couldn't find those internal injuries that she perpetrated against him. But Patricia no longer has control. There is an autopsy, and it confirms oh, everyone's oh, suspicions. I'm going to have to call you back. Police, open up. There was really no investigation here. I mean, the autopsy shows that he died of blunt force trauma and really sadistic sexual assault. And there was only one other person in that room with him. And that was Patricia. In 1990, Patricia Wells Jennings is convicted of first-degree murder. Her death sentence is commuted to life in prison in 2013. I never saw one moment of remorse. Never. William thought he'd found a caring companion to share his twilight years. But Patricia only wanted to take his money and his life. She used, abused, demoralized, made fun of, tortured, and then killed him. No words can express how sorry I feel for William Jennings or how much I hate his wife. Patricia. The vulnerable, our babies and our elderly, there's nothing more dear. Rely on their caregivers. And they thought they were in safe hands. To have warm hearts. She was no Florence Nightingale. Ballina, Australia. An idyllic coastal town. A perfect place to live out your twilight years. So that's the dining room. This is the medication room. In 2014, Megan Haynes moves here to work as a nurse in an aged care facility. Ah, that's Mari. She's one of her kind. She meets one of the home's most beloved residents. Hello, Mari, how are you? 82-year-old Mari Dara. I'd like you to meet our new nurse, Megan. Nice to meet you. You too, yeah. <laughs> Sorry to be such a nuisance. Oh, oh bless me. I dropped it. Yeah. Oh. Mari was full of life. She knew how to have a good laugh and had a good sense of humour about her. What do you listen to? Oh, the GGs. Oh. I love a beer and a bet. <laughs> <laughs> Mari grew up in a regional town working at the local pub there as a barmaid. She would drink like a fish and had a potty mouth, but it made her all the more endearing. Yes. But over the next few days, something strange and dark starts happening in this little patch of paradise. Who was you really? <laughs> of course you were. The new nurse isn't who she seems. She just pulled me out of the chair. Look. Oh, oh yeah. Instead of caring for her patients, Megan is abusing them. Please understand, ladies, that these allegations will be fully investigated. They were all very similar. They all revolved around her being unwilling to help them, unwilling to provide them with care. Megan seemed disgusted when these vulnerable elderly residents asked simple requests. Most people who go into nursing do so because they really want to help the sick. Oh, here at last. <laughs> what do you want? I need me ointment. 
But that wasn't what Megan was interested in. Oh, you're disgusting. Cover yourself up. You can't talk to me like that. I think she was drawn to nursing because it gave her access to victims. You have no idea what I'm capable of. Her misconduct was steadily increasing in severity. There have been three complaints made against you. The first one is Marjorie Patterson. Megan is told there will be a formal investigation. The second is Mari Dara. When these complaints came through, the stakes were high. There will be a disciplinary action this coming Tuesday. Of course. Of course. This is her livelihood. When she heard about the complaints, Megan's desire to seek revenge was out of control. It feeds on itself. It becomes a monster. And that's what happened to Megan. Can you tell me who made these complaints? Well, the first was Marjorie. Nurse Megan Haynes is heading for trouble. The second was Mari Dara. Soon after she starts working in an Australian aged care home, patients are complaining she is mistreating them. An investigation is underway. The director of care came in and she told Megan that there were three residents that had complained about her. Megan could lose her nurse's license and it wouldn't be the first time. A decade earlier, she's deregistered after claims she drugs and robs elderly patients. She injected two elderly, non-diabetic nursing home patients with insulin. And when they were comatose and unconscious, she went through their personal belongings and stole some of their jewelry. That incident resulted in her being fired and losing her license, but she should have gone to jail. But by 2014, Megan is given back her nursing license on strict conditions. Her medical license depended on no complaints being made against her. Now her new life and her career are in jeopardy. She walks in the door and doesn't even have her nurse's shoes on before she starts abusing patients yet again. On May 9th, Megan is working the lonely night shift when she again turns to her weapon of choice. She took out two vials of insulin. While these people were sound asleep in the middle of the night, quietly went in as if to check them on her nightly rounds. She went into Mari's room and into Isabella's room and injected them with insulin. The dose of insulin Megan used could have killed two big, hulking men. She thought insulin overdose was the way to commit a perfect murder. <sighs> Megan makes sure the two women are left alone. There was one point where Mari was heard moaning from her bed. Hi. Mm -hmm. She doesn't want anyone checking their vital signs.
the next day, there are deaths in paradise. The morning shift discovers the bodies of 82-year-old Mari Dara and Isabella Spencer, 77. The deaths appeared natural. They thought that both patients had had a stroke. But two patients dying from the same illness at the same time is a rare event. It was very, very unusual for two patients in such a short time frame to suffer similar conditions in the same ward, and that roused suspicion. Insulin is missing. How much? A lot. And when it's discovered two vials of insulin are missing, the police are called. We're looking for something like this. Yep. You need to speak to Marjorie. They found two empty vials of insulin in a bin. Sir, you better come take a look at this. The only person with a key to the medicine cabinet that night is Megan. And she has been seen acting suspiciously. This is Senior Constable Clark. He's going to ask you some questions. So can you tell me what happened last night? I just woke up and she was here. Who was here? And that's Megan. Dreadful woman. Marjorie was lying in bed and she remembers Megan coming in with a torch. Fortunately for Marjorie, she awakened. Thank you for your time. The police soon discover Marjorie, like the two dead women, You're safe. has accused Megan of abuse. When she heard about the complaints, within a few hours, the patients that made those complaints were dead. The pieces of the puzzle are coming together. Oh, they were searching my place. And when the police tap Megan's phone, they record her telling a friend something only the killer could know. Well, actually, they were given the wrong medication. And this was a real crucial point in the evidence. How else would she have known if she didn't have anything to do with it? In 2016, Megan Haynes is found guilty of two counts of murder and sentenced to a minimum 27 years in jail. I don't think that's enough. I think she needs to spend the rest of her life in prison for society to be safe from her. Megan betrayed the trust of her patients and their families. This was a woman who was meant to be caring for these people and helping them in the most vulnerable stages of their life. She was no Florence Nightingale. She is a very dangerous and very deadly woman. In a man's world. We don't find many women in history like Patty Cannon. On your knees! It takes a special type of woman. She had some very strange fixations. To make her mark. She was a full-blown monster. Sussex County, Delaware, 1810. In the dead of night, a gang goes hunting. Who's it? <laughs> That's your mother-in-law. Its leader is as tough as they come. 50-year-old Patty Cannon. 
Joe, you're new, so you do exactly as I say. Patty was known to dress as a man and portray herself as a man. There were men in the gang, but Patty was the leader. That's how powerful and domineering she was. Her gang, that includes husband Jesse and her son-in-law, works in the grimmest of trades. Illegal slavery. They made money off of kidnapping free black people and then selling them into slavery illegally. On the ground. Get on the ground. On your knees. Now. Get Many on. slaves who had been freed went to Delaware to live, believing they'd be safe. But they didn't know about Patty. I'm a free man. Not anymore. <laughs> Quiet. Being freed doesn't stop Patty. She kidnaps men, women, even children. Quiet. Shut your mouth. <laughs> get up, get up. Patty's victims were at a huge disadvantage. Obviously, first and foremost, they were African Americans, and uh, you know, at that point in time, had very few rights, even if they were free. And to break her prisoner's spirit. She uses torture. They would have been chained. Well. They would have been punished if they complained or tried to assert their freedom. Admit you're a slave. Born free man. But over time, the abuse by Patty and her gang Stop! Shut your mouth. was more than they can handle, and they became submissive and compliant. It appears likely that Patty must have derived some perverse enjoyment from physical violence and cruelty. Free <laughs> man. If her prisoners refuse to become slaves, they face an even worse fate. And that manifested itself, apparently, in many murders. And they're not Patty's only targets. You sure know how to make a man feel welcome, Patty. We're here to please. She and her family also run a tavern. All right, I'm in. Popular with the cashed up illegal slave traders. The slave traders were, were treated well, they offered food and drink and given a grand old time in hopes that they would pay more for the product. There was this huge demand and a lot of money to be made. And individuals like Patty and Jesse saw an opportunity to, to make a bundle. Well? He's got a lot of cash. <laughs> and he's interested, huh? Good. How much is a lot? A small fortune. The traders think Patty's place is a safe haven to do business. But there is no honor among thieves. It's a good night, Patty. Well, it's not over yet. They just see how much money he has, and they get greedy. Rather than make a deal with him, we're going to kill him and take the money. Her husband and son-in-law, Henry Brereton, do her dirty work. Patty was so brazen, she would rob and then murder her own customers and then bury them in the backyard. But they've killed one too many slavers. Authorities managed to pin the murder on Henry.
other members go on the lam. Mama, do something! But Patty remains free. Nothing I can do. Little do they know, she is the leader. How did she do what she did for so many years and continue to escape punishment? It may have something to do with the fact that she was a woman. Look what we do. Keep going. They're not after us. In the 19th century, get this place cleaned up. Very few people could imagine a woman capable of such brutality. Losing most of her gang doesn't stop Patty. She thinks she's untouchable. She was a full-blown monster. In the early 19th century, Patty Cannon gets away with slave trading and murder for more than a decade. Please, no! Papa! Stop your crying. And not all her victims are adults. <laughs> Patty killed uh, more than one uh, small child. Stop your crying. In one case, simply because the child wouldn't stop crying. And Patty just decided to do away with it to to keep her quiet. Terrible, terrible, terrible. Now! <laughs> Patty's reign of cruelty reaches new lows. You wanted to see me, ma'am? No. We wanted to see your baby when she suspects her husband has slept with a servant and produced a baby. Patty was believed that the child was the daughter of her husband. He looks familiar. So out of jealousy, rage, whatever, in turn decided to murder the child to, uh, so that she wasn't reminded. No, 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 no! Patty just enjoyed killing people, that's a fact. Other people's little children, anyone that made her mad, anybody that had a buck in his wallet, she didn't care. What Patty cares about is money. What do you think? I prefer this one on you. And her heinous crimes make her a small fortune. For years, she lives the good life. Until, in 1829, one of her servants makes a bizarre discovery on the property. It was a trunk filled with human remains. The police investigate and discover more than one body. It's another child. This causes one of the gang members to offer his testimony to the police in return for immunity. And so he tells authorities about three murders that he knows about. It wasn't long before Patty was in handcuffs. After avoiding the law for almost two decades, Patty Cannon is finally behind bars, charged with murder.
but she has one more deadly act to perform. Without question, had Patty gone to trial, she would have been found guilty and hung publicly. I don't think Patty wanted to give the satisfaction to the townspeople of her dangling over the gallows. She's poisoned herself and cheated the justice system out of a trial. It doesn't surprise me that Patty took her own life rather than face the music and be hung for her crimes. She's an absolute control freak. So she wanted to be in control of her own life to the very end. She wasn't gonna give that control to the hangman. From this dark period of American history, Patty's legacy lives on in infamy. She killed whites, blacks, adults, children, babies, and even her own paying customers. Patty Cannon could be the ringleader of all the deadly women. These deadly women all targeted the most defenseless. Patricia Jennings took her husband's assets and then his life. Megan Haynes's hatred for the elderly turned lethal, and Patty Cannon only valued human life for the profit. Their victims didn't stand a chance when these three women crossed to the dark side.